Greetings everyone and welcome to part 3 of my wargame tutorial. This will probably be the longest and most boring part. I tried my best to keep it short while also covering the most important parts. But before I get into it, a quick information for you. The unit cards you will see are partially not the same ones you will see in your game because I modded my game so they look different. Just throwing that out there so you do not get confused. The unit names are identical to yours though, unless some names get changed in the patch coming out after I made this video. The armory is quite simply just a database of all the units in game. You will have nearly the same interface when creating or editing a deck. So, let's go to the deck building right away, as most of this stuff also applies to the armory. When creating a deck, you first have to choose between Blue 4, or NATO, and Red 4, or Warsaw Pact, which is pretty straightforward. Next up, you have to choose a nation, coalition, or frankly nothing. A nation is just that, a nation. All nations get an availability bonus based on their strength and have 60 activation points available. I will explain those a bit later. Coalitions are formed by two to three nations and can easily be identified as those if you see two or more flags besides each other. Coalitions have 55 activation points, access to all the prototypes of the nations it consists of, and has an availability bonus depending on its strength. Some coalitions have no availability bonus however. Last but not least, you can choose to not choose anything. This means you have access to the units of all red 4 or blue 4 nations, depending on which side you pick. However, you cannot use any prototypes. Whether a unit is a prototype can easily be seen on this unit card. These so-called mixed decks have only 45 activation points and no availability bonus. Next up are specializations. Specializations give you various boni in one or more categories. These boni can be additional XP for units, which means that all the veterans levels get increased from the get-go. Or you can get cheaper and more slots for specific unit types. Cheaper in this context does not mean that the units cost less, but rather that you do not have to use as many activation points to put them in your deck. Where and how many of these boni you get depends on the specialization you choose. A big disadvantage of them is that they heavily reduce the variety of units you can bring. On the unit card of each unit, you can see to which specialization they are available to. However, you do not have to use a specialization which allows you to play with every unit accessible to the deck. Also keep in mind that not every deck can choose every specialization simply because some of them would be unplayable. Lastly, you can choose to pick a time error. These errors restrict your unit choice in a way that you can't use the units from a specific year onwards. As a trade-off, you get additional activation points. I do not recommend choosing an error at all, as this weakens your deck severely. So let's finally build the deck. Sort of. I will not tell you how to exactly build a good deck, because that would take way too much time. Instead, I am quickly going over the tabs and explain you what the different types of units are for. In my last video, I will show you different decks that you can use since the starter decks suck. Each deck has to fulfill only one thing and that is having at least one command unit in it. Without that, you can't use your deck, the game will refuse to save it. And like I said, they can be identified by their star in their name and the minimum cost of 100 points. Next up, there are supply units in three forms. The FOB, the supply trucks and the supply helicopters. The FOB is a huge amount of supply, but it has to be bought in the deployment phase and it can't be moved once the game has started. Supply trucks and choppers work basically the same way, but they can be moved and bought throughout the whole game. I will get more into detail on how supply units work in a later video. Next up, infantry. The main type of infantry is rifle infantry. They have an anti-tank launcher as the secondary weapon and an MG as their third weapon. Their training goes from militia to shock which, like I said in the last part, determines their overall effectiveness. Then there are special forces, which are basically the same just with elite training, but they have a special name. And they can be recognized by the special red background picture. There are also some exceptions like SAS, which have an anti-air missile instead of an MG. Fist squads are 5 men with no MG, but their anti-tank weapon can also fire against infantry, and often has a higher rate of fire than the anti-tank launcher of other infantry. Man pads are 2 or 5 men with an anti-air missile and no MG. The same goes for ATGM teams. They just have long range anti-tank missiles instead of anti-air missiles. 
Lastly, there are engineer teams, which are either 10 men and have a flamethrower, or 5 men and have a napalm launcher. One thing to note is that some infantry come in transports or helicopters that can very well fight on their own. Some examples are the Mi-24D or the M2A2 Bradley. Some of them decrease the amount of infantry you can get in those transports, so watch out for that. Whether to take infantry in those more expensive transports is up to you. Just keep in mind that there are often situations where you do not need a transport at all, but want your infantry as cheap and maybe also as fast as possible. The support lab holds two kinds of units, artillery and anti-air vehicles. Anti-air basically consists of SPAGs and anti-air systems with missiles. Missile systems usually have higher range than SPAGs, especially against planes. Anti-air units with radar weapons usually also have a greater range than those without, again, especially against planes. When it comes to artillery, there are many different types. Multiple rocket launchers, with either high explosive rockets to kill inside infantry and lightly armored targets, or cluster ammunition, to kill all kinds of vehicles. Then there are the howitzers, that have a long aiming time, except for the high end and expensive ones, but therefore great range and a high amount of high explosive damage. They can also fire smoke rounds to block line of sight. And lastly, there are mortars, which have less range and do less damage than the howitzers, but are cheaper and have a fast aiming time. They also come with a lot of ammunition and can fire smoke rounds as well. About tanks, there is not too much to say. They are best at killing vehicles, but can also fire the infantry. Tanks below roughly 50 points are usually used as fire support or to kill basically anything lightly armored that is not a tank. Tanks more expensive than that are bought to kill enemy tanks and to basically have some sort of defense that the enemy can't break without their own tank or specific counter to it. This is only a very, very rough rule and there are several exceptions, but this should be good enough for new players. Tanks usually only have a fairly weak MG as a secondary weapon, sometimes an autocannon and rarely a grenade launcher. A lot of Red 4 tanks are equipped with anti-tank guided missiles as well. All tanks have their strongest armor on the front and are highly vulnerable at the side, top and rear armor. The recon tab can be roughly divided into three categories, which then have their own subcategories. But I'll keep it simple and leave it at the three. Also, the recon units are the only ones that have optics which are better than medium, which means good, very good and exceptional. On top of that, every recon vehicle has medium stealth, which means that they don't get detected as early as other units, which does not only help them when trying to spot, but also when fighting. Now, let's get into the different types of recon. First, there are the helicopters. Here you can barely make anything wrong. There is no helicopter that is awfully bad. These helicopters could go from cheap, lightly armed ones with good optics to very expensive ones that are armed to the teeth and maybe even have stealth on top of that. The most dangerous helicopter is without a doubt the longbow. Next, there are recon vehicles. Especially the ones with good optics and autocannons or tank guns are very good at both protecting flanks and at helping to attack, so having one card of the type is always good to have, as they are generally very affordable as well. Last, but by no means least, the scout infantry. Very crucial, since they all have at least very good stealth, with the two exceptions being militia scouts. And they all come with very good optics. Put them into a building or in a bush and they are basically invisible. Most elite and shock scout infantry can also hold their ground on their own and make good fighters. The vehicle tab. There are all kinds of different units in there, but the two main types are probably cheap fire support, often in form of World War II or just post-World War II vehicles, and ATGM carriers. There are also low-range spikes and other weird stuff. This is probably the quote-unquote wildest tab with both ancient tank destroyers and most modern anti-GM carriers. Their usefulness can also reach from garbage to god tier, and it would take way too long to explain which are good and which aren't, so let's leave it at that, as this tab is the least important one. When it comes to helicopters, it is nearly impossible to easily explain how useful they are, so I try my best to keep it simple. First of all, it is often enough to take one or two, rarely three cards of helicopters. They are very fragile and hard to use. You usually want one anti-tank helicopter and one anti-air helicopter, or a cheap helicopter with rocket pods as fire support. Depending on the deck, one of those roles may already be filled by a recon helicopter, the longbow for example. The general rule for helicopters is the more expensive, the better they are, 
since you rarely rely on them. Most of the time, you only call one or two out in a single match. There are also exceptions to that rule, like the Fennec Tau 2 for example, which is also a good anti tank helicopter despite being very cheap. Like I said, hard to give tips without getting too much into detail. Planes, the type of units that can turn around the game on their own, in both ways. First, air superiority fighters, or short, ASFs. Generally, don't take any that is cheaper than 100 points, and if you have the veterancy choice between two or more planes, always take the lowest number. If the lowest number would be one, then it's purely up to you. The high-end planes like Rafale become even more deadly, but you only get one of them per card, so if you lose your plane, you lose your whole card. Before I get into the next type, I'm gonna explain the multi-role planes, which are in my opinion no real multi-roles besides a few exceptions. The game already calls a plane multi-role when it carries two short-range anti-air missiles. In reality though, they should only be your last option when fighting planes. The only real multi-role planes, in my opinion, are those equipped with AIM-120s or R-77s as their third weapon. For example, the SC-27M or the Danish F-16 MLU. So before you get confused, I will call planes like the Tornado ADS bombers, despite the game categorizing them under multi roads. Speaking of bombers, rule of thumb is again, the more expensive the better. Also, few bigger bombs are usually better than many smaller bombs, unless of course the proportion is way off. For example, when you compare the payload of the SC-24M with the MiG-29S's payload. One thing to note is that accuracy on bombs is irrelevant. With bombs, you always want to fire position your targets, never right click on an enemy ground unit with them. HE bombs are mostly used against infantry, but also kill lightly armored targets and can damage tanks. Cluster bombs are again purely against vehicles. And napalm bombs damage anything but only over time. It is mostly used to prevent the enemy from crossing a choke point. ATGM planes are a bit different. Nearly all that have two ATGMs with less than 30 AP are rather bad, because they cannot kill a super heavy from the front unless the latter is damaged. Exceptions are planes like the MiG-27, because their gun can penetrate armor. Don't forget, I will go deeper into damage in a different video. The more AP, the better, is the rule of thumb. Accuracy is also very important, so if you have the chance to take 3 at low veterancy or 2 at high, nearly always take the 2. Next up, seed planes. Their missiles work basically like anti gems, but they can only target radar AA, which is turned on. The plane will also spot said anti air unit if it's turned on. Many seed planes also have stealth, making them harder to detect and identify. Lastly, there are the LGB planes. In game, they are classified as bombers, but in reality, they are mostly anti tank planes, with the exception of the Nighthawk, which is also a very good bomber. Their laser guided bombs work like ATGMs, which means you do not have to click fire position but right click the target. They can target both vehicles and infantry and have a 100% hit ratio, making them very deadly against all ground targets. And despite doing only HE damage, they still do a lot of damage to vehicles and tanks, since these bombs hit the top armor and not the front armor. Before I end the plane part, when you look at different ATGMs and ASFs, you will see that some of them have semi-active missiles, while others have fire and forget missiles. Now, you not only have to always keep sight on the enemy unit when using semi-active missiles, but you also can't fire off the next one until your previous missile hit or missed. Against ground targets, the accuracy increases the closer you get. Not against planes though. I'm not going into naval units, there will be an extra video for that, but I will talk a bit about veterancy. With nearly every unit, you have the option to take them on a different veterancy level. Higher veterancy increases the unit's accuracy and makes them recover from morale more quickly, which are the main benefits they get. Note that the number of the accuracy increase is wrong, but the rough rule is, the higher the veterancy level, the bigger is the bonus compared to the previous level. The combat effectiveness is generally not that big. It is mostly notable on planes and anti-air units, but can always be a decisive factor on any unit. Now, how do you know whether to take units like rifle infantry, where the difference is not that big, at higher or lower veterancy? Fairly simple. Just try them out. If you have them at higher veterancy and you run out of them, take them at lower veterancy. And of course it works the other way around. Lastly, to import the deck, just open the deck menu, press the import button down below and paste the deck code. It works the other way around if you want to export the deck as well. 
do note that sometimes YouTube adds random hyphens to the decodes if you copy them from a description. And that's part 3 of the tutorial. Again, thank you very much for watching and bearing with me. See you next time.